Invasive species, feral, domesticated, wild animal. These are terms that we use often when we're talking about conservation, wildlife, and our pets. But more often than not, we're not using those words correctly. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. In this video, we're going to talk about what those words mean and why it is so important to use them correctly for the sake of our pet keeping, our wildlife, and the laws surrounding both of those. Let's start off by defining what an invasive species is. The U.S. Department of Agriculture at the National Invasive Species Information Center as well as USGS, define an invasive species as a species that begins to spread its range from the site of introduction and one that causes environmental, ecological, or economic harm. Now, not all non-native species in the wild are invasive, but all invasive species are non-native. National Geographic says that an invasive species must adapt to its new climate easily, it must be prolific in breeding, and it must cause harm to the environment. Now there are plenty of species of plant and animal that we have here in the United States and all across the world that are non-indigenous to that locale. But because they don't meet those other requirements, they are not invasive species. Things like tomato plants, cows, this may all seem obvious so far, but it's going to get more interesting, I promise you. So some examples of invasive species are like zebra mussels, Burmese pythons in Florida, the brown tree snake in Guam, South American cane toads in Australia, along with things like common carp, which is very widespread across the entire world. Though I could do an entire video about the common carp and how it's become naturalized in some areas, we might get to that a little later in this video. But for right now, let's stick to invasive species. Sometimes non-native species are intentionally introduced. The cane toad in Australia, was intentionally introduced to eat the beetle populations that were eating the produce. The common carp in many areas of the world was intentionally introduced as a food source, believe it or not. Now I've never had carp, but I've heard if it's done right, it's okay. Maybe I'll try that out down the road, but not today. So at what point does an introduced species, an intentionally introduced species by us, become invasive? Well, for that, we have to go back to the definition of invasive. So once that introduced species reproduces too quickly and starts to become harmful to the environment, then it becomes an invasive species. So the fact that that species has established a population does not make it invasive by that merit alone. It has to be causing harm to the environment and the population has to be growing out of control. One good example of this is in 1949, five cats were brought to Marion Island off the coast of South Africa as a means to control the mice population. By 1977, there were 3,500 cats living on that island, and the bird population quickly became endangered. It's in the thumbnail. Let's talk about cats. I love cats. I love every kind of cat. I just want to hug all of them, but I can't get hug every I'm going to have to look at my notes for this one. So feral cats in Australia number about 6.3 million. They're estimated to kill 1.67 billion mammals, 399 million birds, 609 million reptiles, and 92 million frogs annually every year. In the U.S., the number is 73 million. You can do the math on that one. In Hawaii, it's gotten so bad that they're responsible for 33 extinctions of different species. So that brings us to our main question. This is the pivot point of this whole video. So why is it that we never hear about cats being referred to as an invasive species? Whenever you hear about a cat problem, it's always feral cats, not invasive cats. They certainly fit the definition of invasive. So why are cats, who are responsible for some of the greatest environmental impacts, not referred to as invasive, but things like a Burmese python in Florida would be considered invasive? This is the part where it gets super interesting. We refer to them as feral in order to separate our pet cats from non-socialized, non-tame, wild cats in our minds. But they're the same animal. It's the same species. If we went around calling cats invasive on the regular, would we still be allowed to keep cats? Or would it be like every other animal that's considered invasive, and would there be a ban on it? So we have to do this kind of verbal, mental gymnastic kind of dance to separate cats into two categories. Feral and domestic, and maybe that's a good thing. 
It would really suck if the government decided you can't keep cats because of the detriment that they cause on the environment, especially when they're released into the wild and establish a massive breeding population, one that decimates several species to the point of extinction. But does that mean that the government should step in and tell us that we can't own cats? I don't think so. So why is that the case in so many places with other non-native species that have or have the potential to become invasive species? Reptiles specifically fall into this category. Burmese pythons, for example. Looking at you, Florida. But even in New York, where they wouldn't survive here past Thanksgiving, it is impossible for them to establish a breeding population here. But New York still likes to use terms like invasive when it comes to Burmese python. And that's because invasive is a buzzword. It's something that makes you feel like the situation is dire and serious. And in some places it is. The Burmese python issue in Florida is not a joke. It is a real thing. It is a detriment to the environment down there. And they do need to get those snakes out of there. But when terms are used incorrectly, like here in New York, invasive Burmese pythons are not a thing and will never be a thing. But they're copying Florida. And that's why it's so important that the lawmakers understand these terms and that we are able to present them to them correctly. Sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent. Let's get back into it. So why is there no distinction between less common pets and invasive examples of those pets as there is with cats? Why is there no feral snake? Well, you might think that answer is obvious. You might think, John, snakes are wild animals and cats are domesticated. Obvious. Well, I'd like to dive into that a little bit. So to really break that down, we have to look at the definitions of those two terms, domesticated and wild animal. We'll start with wild animal. Does that term mean something that isn't tame or socialized or that behaves wildly? and lives out in nature? Well, no, because that would describe feral cats. So what is it? Across the web, it's referred to as an animal that is not domesticated and that lives in its natural environment. Okay, well, the definition of that is to use the opposite of what it is to tell you what it is. So that doesn't really help us very much. So now we gotta look at what domesticated means. National Geographic defines domesticated animals as animals that have been selectively bred and genetically adapted to live alongside humans. Domestication happens through selective breeding. Individuals that exhibit desirable traits are selected to be bred, and these desirable traits are then passed along to future generations. University of Cambridge simplifies it a lot more by saying, not wild and kept as a pet or to produce food. That's really basic. Encyclopedia Britannica considers honeybees, silkworms, and other less obvious species as domesticated animals. I find that very interesting. All right, let's break this down a little further. It says it takes several generations of selective breeding. So how many generations is enough for us to call an animal domesticated? The general consensus in the scientific community varies a little bit. Some say that it takes at least 12 generations and others say 10 to 14 generations is enough to domesticate an animal. There's a common misconception that comes up in arguments like this often, that dogs were domesticated over thousands of years because we know that dogs were domesticated between 18,000 and 32,000 years ago. But that doesn't mean that it took 18,000 years to domesticate a dog. It took 18 to 32,000 years to have the dogs we have today, but in reality, those ancient peoples who had domesticated dogs did so in likely 10 to 14 generations of selective breeding. Does that make sense? I think so. So, could a snake ever be considered a domesticated pet? Well, let's take the most commonly bred snake, the most popular snake on the market, the ball python, and see if it ticks off the boxes. Pet ball pythons are not living in the wild, Check. Genetically different than their wild counterparts. Check. Kept as a pet. Yes. And selectively bred for 10 to 14 generations. Ish. So ball pythons started being bred heavily in the 90s. Even though people had them all the way back to the 70s, it wasn't really until the 90s that they took off and people were breeding them consistently. And since ball pythons sexually mature, well, males mature a little earlier than females, around 16 to 18 months, and then females usually mature at the latest 31 months. So let's just round up there and say it's three years for sexual maturity for a ball python. 
from 1990 to 2023, that's what year it is, right? Yes. That's 11 potential generations. So that does fall within that window. And ball pythons have been bred not just for the way they look, but to accentuate their docile temperament. So are we at a point that we could consider a snake domesticated? I think so. But that's an argument that a lot of people aren't going to like very much. So if a pet is viewed as unconventional, as all pets once were, and it checks off all the requirements for being domesticated, do we then stop considering pet versions of that animal a wild animal? Do we give them the same leeway we give cats? Or should we just treat cats the same way we treat other potentially invasive species and outlaw them as well? I think you guys know my stance. Let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree. Please be kind to each other. And if you learned something or if this was at least thought provoking, leave this video a like, consider subscribing. I would appreciate that very much. Take care of yourselves and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye. The University of Cambridge simplifies it. The University of Cambridge simplifies it. Simplifies it. The University of Cambridge simplifies it. Simplifies it. <laughs>